Good morning, everyone. Thanks a lot for coming to the Data Colada seminar series. Um, I'm very pleased uh, to introduce today's speaker, Maya Bar Halal, who's going to be talking about the false lure of fast lures uh, and her joint work with Egal Atali. We also have a very distinguished panel, set of panelists today uh, David Pudescu, Jason Dana, Shane Frederick, Celia Gertig, Danny Kahneman, and Deb Small, as well as Joe Simmons and Yuri Simonson and myself. Uh, for the duration of the talk, you'll see the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. Feel free to submit any questions or comments as we go. Uh, Maya is going to be obviously too busy to read them as she goes, but fortunately she has all the rest of us to read them and potentially voice some of those questions or comments to her. And even if we don't get a chance to get to those, they will all be recorded so we can give them to her after the, after the session so she can read them and think about them. So with that, Maya, the floor is yours and uh, we look forward to your presentation. Thank you. So this project started when Iga Latali, who is my former PhD student, was visiting in Israel some uh, time ago. And we got to talk somehow about uh, the CRT, which I think lots of people talk about. It's a very engaging uh, type of uh, cognitive item. And Eagle said, I don't understand what all the commotion is about. I think CRT items are just math items. And I said, but Eagle, obviously they're not standard math items. They have this cool feature that an answer comes to mind and it's the wrong answer and smart, knowledgeable, mathematically sophisticated people often miss it in spite of themselves. They, they do know better, they should know better. And that's the cool feature of those items. And he said, I'm sure we can find math items, regular math items with the same property. And I bet you that they'll do as well as, uh, as the CRT items. And that conversation kind of began the collaboration I'll tell you about today. And I have to say that it, it, neither of us was much of an expert on CRT items, but Eagle is an expert on testing and measurement, which played an important role in, in what I'll be talking about. And I'm very sorry that Eagle couldn't, uh, couldn't join us today. So, uh, in case I go by some things too fast for you or I'll give too little detail here and there, uh, most of what I'll be talking about can be found in writing in a paper that was published early this year. It seems like it was a different eon because it was before COVID-19 appeared on the, on the scene and you can find it uh, in this reference. So, uh, the cognitive reflection uh, test, which first appeared under that name in Shane Frederick's uh, 2005 paper, which has had over four, well over 4,000 citations in Google Scholar by now, has three very familiar by now questions in it. Uh, and I won't go into them because, I'll, because even those of you who don't know exactly what they are will get as much as they need to know to follow but they're typically called the bat and ball, the widgets, and the lily pads. I will, I, I made a little note here that it's curiously difficult to develop new and satisfactory cognitive reflection items. In fact, uh, besides the three that were published in 2005, here we are in 2020, and possibly there are as many by now as a dozen of uh, cognitive reflection uh, test items. I was going to say cer certified ones, but it's not clear who gives the certification. So I'm not sure that even that they're certified. But in 15 years of research, there haven't been 15 years of new items. And that is a drawback if you want to use CRT items for all the things that have been suggested for it because if it, if, if it were to become as important as IQ tests, which some people think that this is a miracle shortcut to, then it's very easy to prepare if, if the number of items is not that large, and even those that exist are variations on existing ones. But 
this is not the topic of my talk. And unless some of, uh, anybody of the panelists wants to challenge me on anything I say that besides the point, we will move on because this is not a talk about CRT ideas. So I told you what the initial motivation was and that uh, what we are going to be doing in research is getting data that can answer the question whether regular math items are any different than CRT items in two senses. First of all, whether, some, whether confirmatory factor analysis will show that there are two factors, one unique to CRT items, the other to math items, and whether when you let them compete with each other in terms of what can they do, whether CRT items outperform the regular uh, math items. Now, uh, he, here is what we did. It's really quite, quite simple. We searched the literature, which as I said, neither of us was particularly familiar with. We searched the literature to find all the CRT items we could. And I, 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 I regret to say we only found six. Turns out we missed some. And when I said to you that by now that there may be a dozen or more, not all of them were published when we began the study, but we should have picked up another one or two and didn't. Anyway, what we did is use three items from finocaine and bullion, which are essentially Shane's three problems under a different cover story and different numbers, but uh, mathematically iso isomorphic, and three newer items that appeared in a paper by Toplak and her colleagues in, in, in 2014. Now, when I said to you that I don't need to go through the original items, I will go with you now through the, through the six items we used, because in this research, it's really important what the stimuli are. Now, I personally believe that it's important what the stimuli are in all research. And when I am a referee, I always insist that me as a reader, I need to know exactly what the subjects saw exactly what the subjects were told. It is never enough for me if the authors say, we gave so-and-so number of subjects uh, questions about such and such and told them to solve it. No, 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 no. I want to see the questions. I want to see the instructions. It, it, it's a case where not just God is in the details, science is in the details. And as you will see, we ran into some problem with these uh, questions, even though we didn't, uh, we didn't offer them ourselves. As I told you, we just searched the literature and that's what we came up with. But let's go through them. So soup and salad costs $5.50 in total. The soup costs a dollar more than the salad. How much does the salad cost in dollars? And anybody who knows the bet and ball problem sees right away two things. A, it's isomorphic to the bet and ball problem. And B, it sucks. In other words, whoever decided to, the, to design this question could have, because there are some, could have easily rephrased the bat and ball problem as paper and pencil, as printer and ink, as lots of things, and used numbers that don't necessarily have to be the original 100 and 110, but this one was bad. However, that's what it is. The second one, if it takes two nurses two minutes to measure the blood pressure of two patients, how long would it take 200 nurses to measure the blood pressure of 200 patients? I see nothing wrong with that. And it's very much like the widget original problem. Sally is making sun tea. Every hour, the concentration of tea doubles. Uh, it, it, the, the photos here hide some of the question for me, but they don't do it for you so you can read the rest of it. Of course, this question has become very pertinent in these days of COVID-19 because what we were told in the initial weeks was that, that the number of people infected doubles every, say, week. So if you have 2,000 people by week seven, how many people infected are you going to have by week eight? And this exponential thing played a huge role in some of the politics and policies of COVID-19. Although, as you, those of you who read a lot are well aware, 
it's now uh, given way to other considerations besides expo exponential growth, such as the fact that these things don't happen uniformly across the board. Apparently, there's this phenomenon of super spreaders. But again, this is not my topic, so I won't let myself run away with it. Oh, and, and so here are some uh, problems that were not in Shane's original three. If John can drink one barrel of water in six days and Mary can drink one, ba one barrel of water in 12 days, how long would it take them to drink one barrel, barrel of water together? If Jerry received both the 15 highest and the 15 lowest mark in the class, how many students are in this class? And finally, a man buys a pick for $60, sells it for 70, buys it back for 80, and sells it for 90. How much has he made? As far as my judgment goes, only the first question is horrible. The rest are fine. Shane, do you agree? No. Okay, there you go. There you go. Now, uh, I, I, a, a slight digression here. I myself am, uh, am a fan of a type of, of riddle called stumpers. Some of you perhaps have had a chance to hear me give talks because I've been, I've been giving some talks in America in recent years about my stumpers. It doesn't matter now exactly what stumpers are, but I didn't want stumpers to have the fate of CRTs. I didn't want them to be a, a, a class so rare that it's hard to add anything to. And I didn't want to be in a position where there is a sense that some people have that either you're risking making bad ones or Shane has to certify them. So uh, I, I put together a compendium of stumpers, which includes dozens and dozens of them. And Shane, who's been my partner in stumper research, can attest to the fact that it took us several years to come up with the five stumpers in a, the paper we wrote together about stumpers some years ago. But since, since then, since I've understood what stumpers really are, I have dozens and dozens of stumpers, including many that I've made up myself. So uh, if any of you are interested in a collection of stumpers, you can find them according to this slide. And back Maya. to uh, Maya and Shane, can you say a bit more about what criteria you use for what makes a good CRT or a bad CRT item? Uh, Shane, I, you I, should. I, I um, sure. I, I think that, in my view, what makes a good item is that there's a answer which m most people, ideally a large majority of people, at least initially, um, comes to their mind initially. Um, there has to be, I think, um, the problem has to be, I have the problem has to, it has to be hard enough or tricky enough that that occurs. The problem has to be simple enough that you can get to the correct answer once you recognize that is, you know, that the intuitive answer is incorrect. And uh, I, I, one thing I just want to note is that it really depends on the IQ of the population. So I was trying, I was trying to something that not Danny and Egal and Maya and I have done in subsequent work, trying to create a sort of a set of control problems. And I think it's, it's worth asking what exactly you're trying to control. But I was trying to do that once uh, and a while back, and I created this problem, which I thought, surely there's no, no answer will pop into your head. And I said, if you flip a fair coin three times, what's the probability of flipping heads at least once? And so I thought, Jesus, it's like you got to enumerate the event space and like figure out how many of those triplets contain at least one head. And surely nothing will pop into mind for anybody. And then I ran the and then I ran the item. Thirty three percent was a very very common answer, right? So for many people, that functioned effectively as a CRT item, like you know, for them, for a sort of a normal ability population. I actually intended it as a control item, and it actually functions as a CRT item. Now, would it, would that item have the characteristics of a CRT? I, I think for that group it would, um, because one should think next. This almost never occurs, by the way. But uh, which is one of the reasons I think these problems don't work as I sort of I intended. But one should think next to say, well, wait a second. If I just took the fair coin once, it would be 50%. And these are extra chances. So it should be whatever it is, it should be higher than 50%. And you could score it anywhere from 51 to 99 as being correct. Like they kind of understood the logic of it. Um, but I guess like one of the problems is that the, like, I don't want to take too much time, but like for me, like, for me noticing that or that moment where, you say, wait a second, things aren't quite right. 
uh, I, I can do more here. That's like, that's a, that's a psychologically, you know, psychologically and intellectually interesting event. I don't know how often it occurs. I don't know how many people who lack the sophisticated, I mean, I know people who lack the sophistication to set up that problem correctly the first time, possess the sophistication to, to meaningfully check their intuitive response. And so like, I can't, this thing, these items don't really work that well because people can't do anything. Like they, they say 10 and then like, they don't know what to do next, even, if they, even, even when they recognize it as being wrong. So I think it, 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 whether something's a good item or not, depends a lot on the abilities of the population that you're, that you're testing. But um, one, of the, one of the objections, which I think is largely cured in Maya's subsequent research is a lot of these things, I don't think I have very compelling lures. And so a lot of the items that they used and some of the items that they use as controls do have compelling lures. So I didn't think this is a particularly good comparison, but it turns out that it probably doesn't matter. She's right anyway. Okay. Now, it, it, we're, we're coming to where it turns out that a lot of things that don't matter, such as it doesn't matter that the soup and salad sucks. And it doesn't matter something that we spent a lot of effort on, which I'm coming to now. It does, but it only doesn't matter in hindsight. It mattered a lot when we were planning the study. And here's, here's the thing. Uh, one of the advantages uh, that Igal Atali enjoyed at the time, he no longer enjoys it. He was then employed at the ETS and therefore he had access to a lot of their, uh, a lot of their data, a lot of the data bank. In particular, he had access to this bank of 365 items uh, that, that not only were there, but he, he knew two things about them. He knew the level of difficulty, in other words, the percent of people who were answering them correct, and he, knew, and he had reaction times. He had data of how long it took people on average to reach the correct answer, how long it, it took people to reach the first answer whether or not it was correct and so on so we looked at this data bank and this uh, picture shows you all 365 items classified according to their difficulty on the y-axis and the difference between the time it takes to to get to the correct answer minus the time it takes to get to a wrong answer and the blue line distinguishes between items to which you, you, a wrong answer comes to mind faster than the correct answer. They are a minority. Most items, the correct answer comes to mind first, but clearly the ones to the right of the blue line, which we call math items with fast lures, have this property of CRT items, which is that something incorrect is the first thing to come to mind. So we selected from them the ones that are painted in red. And as far as I know, the selection was done by nothing except seat of pants. I mean, I didn't even see all of them. I saw only the red ones. And what we see here is that they cover the range of difficulty. But why these were chosen rather than others, I think it was just a matter of, of judgment. They, Eagle read them and chose the ones he chose. So there are 12 here that we chose. Maya, can I ask a question? Can I ask a question about that? Sure. A brief one, if you just go back to the previous slide. It does look like they, you chose ones that are most extreme in terms of having the biggest RT difference between correct and error. I guess the question I'm asking is, you use the word error here. Do you mean errors? Like, I'm curious whether this is like all wrong answers? No, um, as, you will see, as you will see in a minute, there is a single error that's the one that comes to mind. And I'm going to give you a, a, an example of the items in the next slide. And you, you and the rest of the audience can probably all experience it because the answers are not going to appear. So there, there were, uh, I guess there are 12 here. There were 12 of these items. And here are some of them. Three cubed minus three squared divided by three equals. So, you know, you can you can ask yourself what comes quickly to mind, and uh, the the correct answer I believe is twenty seven, and the one that comes to mind I believe is three. But I have that written out somewhere. If the square root of x is sixteen, then x equals. Lots of people apparently answer four. It comes to mind before two hundred and fifty six. 
of the numbers 4, 8, 9, 11, or 12, which one is not a divisor of, I can't see the number, it's behind, it's behind you guys' photos. Was it 254? 264. 264. Apparently, the most popular, uh, the, the, the answer that comes fastest to mind is 11, and the correct answer is 9. And finally, what is the length <laughs> of the side of a square of, of whose perimeter is whatever it says there. And again, I did not put, but my paper has what the popular and erroneous answer is and what the correct answer is. But to answer your question, Shane, in all of the items we chose, it's not that an error was faster than the correct answer. A particular error, one particular error was faster than the correct answer. And judging by the smiles on the faces of my panelists, some of you fell for it. Now, no, maybe, I, I shouldn't, I, maybe I shouldn't say fell for it. Maybe I should say, yeah, that's what I thought of first too, but I'm too smart to have given it. I gave it another moment of thought and I, and I got to the correct answer. Okay, now we also selected math items without a fast lure, simply from the left side of the, of the blue line. And that gave us our set of that gave us our set of 18 math items and i'm giving you here some examples of the standard math items and in spite of my opening spiel that the details matter a lot i would say that the place where they don't matter a lot is how exactly did we select from uh, hundreds of math items how did we select whatever we selected these look like standard math items and i'm giving them to you as examples and as I said, even though some people get them right and some people get them wrong because they cover the entire range of difficulty, there is not a single answer that pops to mind before the correct answer on average. Okay, now, uh, so our subjects got a mixed bag of the six CRT items I showed you, plus, uh, I believe, six plus six or 12, I don't remember any longer, uh, math items with fast lures, I think 12, plus 12 math items with fast lures, plus another 12 math items without fast lures. That was their bag of math questions. And in addition, they did uh, all the uh, reasoning tasks that were included in Paul Pleck, Weston Stanovich's paper and, in, and some of those used by Shane in, in his paper. And why those? Because we chose what we chose, no particular reason. And turns out to be somewhat of a drawback of the study in hindsight, but only in the sense that, uh, that, that of the ability to generalize. But let's go a, a little bit through what the tasks were. So uh, about a dozen of them were standard ta ta tasks familiar from the JDM literature. Uh, I, am, I don't have the time to go over each and every one of them, but anybody who wants to see them in detail, they're reproduced in full in the paper I gave you the reference to. And for some of you, just the prompt will be enough. The famous uh, large hospital, small hospital of Kahneman and Tversky for sample size, uh, Kahneman and Tversky's uh, tennis example with, with then star Borg, uh, tennis star Borg. Core variation detection involves uh, showing people a two by two table and asking them whether this table does or, does or does not have a dependence between the row factor and the column factor. And some of these things are harder to uh, to give a shortcut. And as I said, I don't have the time for them, but all the details are in the paper. And the main thing is that it covers a, an assortment of what some people call reasoning tasks, other people call heuristics and biases tasks, JDM tasks that are familiar from the literature. In addition, there were two choice and decision-making tasks. These tasks are not uh, decision-making, they're judgment tasks. These tasks are what do you prefer tasks. So there were five that involved a delay of, uh, of reward. Here are the five. I'll leave it on the screen for a second. 
Again, the details can be found in the paper. And then all 10 of these graded, which do you prefer that have a particular order to them, the probability of, uh, uh, of one of them goes, one of them is a sure thing and the other one is ordered so that the probability goes down. A host of, do you prefer something for sure or a certain gamble? And they got all of these. And again, why? Because Toplak uh, and her colleagues used them or Shane used them. So uh, uh, altogether, we recruited 252 people on the Enter platform who uh, answered the items that you saw now according to the following design. The, the, oh, they started with the math and CRT problems in a randomized order, something I'll have to come back to later. The reasoning and choice problems were divided were not randomized. We only had two orders, a fixed order. Half of the people got one fixed order, half got another fixed order. The details are in the paper. And some of the people got the math problems before the reasoning and choice problems. Some of them got the reasoning and choice problems before the math problems. So some things were randomized. What was not randomized is the order of the items in the reasoning tasks within the, within the, the blocks. And the question, as, uh, as I said, was, is the fact that we know that some of these questions have, have this wonderful feature of having a lure, is that going to be picked up by a factor analysis? So are these, are these two kinds of items measuring the same underlying ability or not? And how, how, how well do they fare when they compete for predicting other variables? Now, before I give you the results of the confirmatory factor analysis we did, here are just some descriptive results to show you how, in fact, similar the CRT items, good or bad as they may be by the considerations Shane uh, put forth, and the uh, math with fast lower items are, and as you see, they are hardly uh, distinguishable, especially on the important variable, which is the lure. They, they happened to be equally difficult. We know in advance the difficulty of the math items based on the GRE data bank, not that it necessarily has to repeat with, with our enter workers, but what we found out, even though we didn't do any selection for it, is that the items were about equally uh, difficult and they were, and the lure was about equally attractive. Ah, this is a highlight. Okay, now here is the result of the confirmatory factor analysis, and I'm going to read it to you from our paper. Uh, I have to here make a confession that I did not what, know what confirmatory factor analysis was when. Uh, Iga suggested that we do it, but here is what I know about it now. So the table shows you CFI is a comparative fit index, PLI is the Tucker-Lewis index, and RMSEA is the root mean square error of approximation. Typically, TLI and CFI larger than 0.95, which is the case here, alongside RMSEA lower than, than, than 0 0.05, which is the case here, suggests excellent fit of data to a model. The table shows that all three models have excellent fit. Now, what are these models? As you see, one of them says all 24 items are the same. The other says, no, there's a difference between items that have a fast lure or in another terminology, that requires some reflection in order to deflect the fast lure and realize there must be another answer. And, and another two-factor possibility is that the CRT items are a class onto themselves and the math items are another class, whether or not they have a lure. So these are the three possibilities here. And all three models have excellent fit. And the differences between them are negligible. In addition, the estimated correlations between the factors in the two-factor models are very high, uh, uh, 0.90 at least, and this is called 
for discriminant validity is the degree the two separate scales are actually unrelated. Factor correlations that exceed 0.85 are often used as a cutoff criterion for problematic discriminant validity. When factors overlap to a higher degree, as they do here, it is often recommended to combine the factors for a more parsimonious solutions. In other words, what this paragraph is telling you is that it looks like you can do just as well with one factor as with, with, a, with two, whichever way you are dividing the two. Okay, so uh, the, the, the third RQ3 is the third research question. Does the quality of the CRT and other math items as math, indicate, as math indicators I don't, I don't see my own slides under your photos, but you see them and that's what's important. So our next move is going to, is, is going to, is going to say the following. According to measurement theory, how well an item does doesn't depend on the properties that we were focusing on, but only on its quality as an item of its category. So how is quality, uh, how is quality, measured. It's measured by the point by serial, which is the correlation between an individual item and the set of all items. And as this figure shows you, the quality of the CRT items is, it, it, there's a range of qualities, and the range is more or less the same as the range of qualities of the math items. And now we'll see how well they do when uh, when predicting performance on the reasoning and choice tasks. And what you see here, if you see these things as I see them, is that the red dots are interspersed among the math dots in a way that I bet that if the slide were color free and I had asked you to pick out the six CRT items, you probably would not have been able to do so and that what you see is not a division of the uh, ability according to the Y scale of the, of the how well these items perform. It's not divided by having the red dots cluster in one part of the picture and the other dots in the other, but rather it's related to the quality of the items as math items. It's related to their point by serial uh, making the same point. Yes, Shane. I was, I was just, I don't know if you're going to get to it or not. I thought you could actually add here something I found pretty interesting in your paper, which goes beyond saying CRT is just math. You basically find that reasoning items are just math. And in that, you found that the mathematical items basically correlated more highly with reasoning items than the reasoning items themselves. Um, I thought that was an interesting, that was an interesting uh, finding that you had. And you could even have, a, could have even had a bolder title of your paper saying that reasoning is just math. Of course, I mean, okay. this is a pretty, this is a pretty, this is a pretty math heavy set of reasoning tasks. And I don't love it for, you know, but still, at least you use these quite, quite reasonably, given, given what other people have used historically in literature and use these and had that result. And I thought that was kind of interesting. I was, I was hoping you'd mention it. So, yeah, in fact, you're anticipating something I'm going to say later, which I will hint at now, which is it, 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 it seems that it's not about having a lure or not. And it's not even about whether it's math or not, but we will get to that later. So what is it exactly that the math items, the CRT items, and the reasoning items all have in common, as well as other tasks that by now some people have looked at, is kind of the big question. You're saying reasoning is math, and other people are saying, and perhaps Shane, at the end of the day, the four of us, uh, you and Danny and Eagle and I, maybe will be saying, you know, that there's a common element that is none of the things we have looked at up to now, but we're not in a position yet to say what it is. So, so okay. Maya? Yeah. Uh, Maya, can I? Yeah. So I think there's, I'm, I'm unwilling to give up the fast lower CRT kind of idea in spite of your data, but one, one possible problem, you can comment on it. A lot of times uh, there's just this correlation between having a lure and also having like a math level. So, so Danny had an insight problem, I guess, where you were asking like uh, from eight people, can you make more unique groups of two or more unique groups of six? And 
if you're if you're not trained in combinatorics, you have to have the insight that every time you pull out two from eight, there has to be a six. So it's the same. But if you actually do like eight factorial divided by two factorial times six factorial, then you automatically see that it's also the same question. And part of what you're doing and part of what Shane suggested is that you're you're kind of um, filtering on ability. So if the item is really easy and everyone answers it, then, then it can't be a CRT. And if the item is really hard and people fail it. But I think if you conditioned on math ability at almost every level, there are uh, what I would call trick problems. So uh, mathematicians write about Jewish problems. And these were problems used in Russian universities to fail Jewish students. And the thing is, they're very hard if you don't know the insight to the, to the proof. But if you have the insight to the proof in front of you, then it looks like any competent mathematician ought to be able to do it. Now, it wouldn't be a CRT item for us because we couldn't do any of them anyway. They're really hard. But, but at, at any level, you could probably, if you were fixing the level of math ability, I bet you could find problems that, are, that have like an intuitive wrong answer and, and problems that don't, right? I don't know. But. So it, 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 I, I agree with everything you said, especially since you concede that it kind of depends on the population, which is also the point that Shane made, made earlier. But here's something that we thought, I, I actually, I'm glad for your question because I promised to address it and I forgot it and now I will address it. Uh, initially, I think everybody thinks that it's not just about whether the question is hard or not and whether the correct answer comes to mind or not, but that it's critically important that this feature that what comes to mind is a single error, that there's a single error that attracts you. Now that can be found in math problems, but as you saw from the one of the initial pictures I showed you, it's it's a characteristic of a minority of the math problems. Most math problems can be hard or easy, but it's not the case that there's a single error that the reaction time to which is faster than, than correct. So what turns out to be unimportant, and in a minute I'll mention another study that says so, is not whether you have the wherewithal to answer either the CRTs or the math, but what turns out to be unimportant is whether these problems are just hard or whether they include a lure. That turns out to be the, 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 this factor that was referred to in the literature as requiring reflection turns out not to be important. Now, since you asked uh, your question, let me also say that, that uh, we pointed out in the beginning of our paper that, uh, that in, a, it, it, in fact, every math question requires some reflection. It's kind of up to you whether when you even when you solve a math problem algorithmically, it's kind of up to you to ask yourself, is this the correct answer? Things like, can it possible, does it make sense? I remember how angry I used to be at my students when I gave them, uh, when I taught them how to do algebra word problems, when they applied what they thought was the algorithm and they came up with minus 3.5 as an answer to the question, how many kids were in the house? Minus 3.5 cannot be the answer to the question, how many kids were in the house? So it, even when you're using an algorithm, it's up to you whether you trust it or not, whether you reflect on it or not, whether you want to do it again or not. So uh, Iga claims that this is not even a unique feature of items as much as perhaps a feature of people. Some people are more careful, more reflective, more prone to reconsider than others. So it's perhaps more of an individual difference of the responder than of the question. M Maya, can I, follow, can I follow up on that and just ask what you yes, think? Yes, especially now. if while you're doing it, I'm going to go and get something to drink because my mouth is completely <laughs> dry. I hear you. All right, very good. Uh, so I was, I was curious whether you would want to give someone credit, I don't have an answer to this really, um, whether you'd want to give someone credit for reflection if upon encountering the bat and ball problem, they started writing down a series of equations and it came to the correct answer. I'd have to say it again. Whether I want to give credit on reflection would, to would, what? Would you want to give credit to someone who upon encountering the bat and ball problem started to write out a set of equations, came up with the correct answer and wrote that correct answer down? I don't think that person has necessarily engaged in any reflection. They've just executed an algorithm that they've learned or overlearned, 
and came to the correct answer. I don't, I don't think they had this, mo I don't think they had this moment where uh, they like 100 minus 10, wait a second, that's not a hundred dollar difference or whatever. This kind of, what I, what I think is this sort of the psychologically interesting moment, which I'm not sure often it occurs. And I guess part of like, you know, it's, it's hard to know. I mean, these people are giving the correct answer, but they aren't necessarily engaging in any reflection, in, in my view. And the question is whether you want to count those people as having, I mean, how, how you would treat such, a, such, such, such people. Uh, I, and I know, I know many, many, half of my colleagues are, are, are people like this, basically. Like my ask Ed Kaplan always, well, what, what's your intuition? I don't have an intuition. He's talk, he wants to start writing math down. He, he, he may be right, he may actually not have it. Or, or he's unwilling to say it, I don't, I don't know. But I'm just curious how you think about that. I don't have anything offhand to, uh, to reply to that. It's something I'll have to think about. I, I was going to say, what else was on my mind? I was going to say something. Ah, yes. I was going to say that when, uh, that when one learns to solve uh, so-called word problems, which is what CRT items, if they're math items, they are word problems and math items, is to find the proper algorithm. So bat and ball is kind of easy in the sense that the proper way to solve it is to solve two equations with two unknowns. But if you're told, that, a that five machines make five widgets in five minutes, how long would it take 100 machines to make, to make 100 uh, widgets? What is unclear is what's the algorithm to use? Turns out you don't need to use an algorithm. You need to use your brain, your mind. You need to somehow realize that, hey, when machines, it, 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 when the number of machines matches the numbers of widgets, that takes five minutes. So the five, five, five is just uh, dust in your eyes. What matters is the first two fives. They're telling you that if the ratio of machines to widgets is one, that takes five minutes. Now it's not about an algorithm. So we learn algorithms, but I think the difficulty in algebra word problems is what's the right algorithm that this question calls for. But again, that's a totally different topic, very interesting, but not one that I have anything particular to say about now. Maria, so, yes. One question that I'm rephrasing from the audience as well. So if you were to introduce an intervention such as giving people more time to solve the problem or um, making them write down the path, they find the solution, do you think that would affect the CRT questions in the same way as it would affect the math questions or would there be a difference? Okay, so I don't know, but rather than Maya, can you repeat the questions? I I couldn't hear the question. The question was whether if people, if I intervened and told people uh, to spend more time to think about it again, am I rephrasing it correctly, Celia? If I somehow intervened and told them stop, think, reconsider, how would it affect my results? Was that the questions, more or less? Yeah, so we would assume, right, if math, if math questions and the CRT questions are the same, then an intervention that like that should affect them in the same way. But if they are different, then they, such an intervention would probably affect them differently. Okay, so as I said, I don't know and I don't want to guess, but I'll answer a related question that I owe you about, which is, I told you that in our study, the CRT problems and the math problems were randomly mixed. And what came out later in the discussions that the four of us that I've mentioned before, Shane, Danny, Eagle, and myself have conducted with an eye to expanding the, the, uh, the breadth of the paper I'm talking about today, was that when you put CRT questions, when they're embedded among math problems, you're actually saying to the subjects, these are math problems. And of course, when CRT problems are given in all of the experimental contexts in which they were given, they were not mixed up with math problems. They were given as a class unto themselves. Nobody said either that they are math problems or that they aren't math problems, but we were certainly saying these are math problems so that, uh, to come back to your question, possibly under the design we used, we wouldn't have found a difference between CRT and math regardless, because they, they just, the subjects regard the CRT as 
math problems, they don't come tagged as, as anything special. But what would happen if we blocked the CRTs and the math problems, which is what we've been planning to do and beginning to do in our next project? I don't know exactly. And certainly one can think of manipulations such as the one you thought about that might tease apart CRTs from math. Now, I see what the time is, and let me therefore go quickly through what I have left. I'm not going to go through study two because study two is the same as study one, except for technical details, that the subjects were different, the math items were different, uh, the CRT items were different, et cetera, et cetera. Same picture, same results. Uh, but but let, let me tell you, this is as far as the paper got. And uh, Eagle presented this paper at the JDM in Montreal last year. I wasn't there, maybe some of you were. And he had a slide in which the, uh, one of his conclusions was, uh, to rephrase Annie Oakley, if any of you remember Annie Oakley, anything you can do, I can do better. So Eagle thought that we could summarize our results as anything CR2 can, can do, math items can do better or at least as well. Now, let me explain why better. Eagle found that CRT items, although we're calling them just math items, they are very good math items. Math items come in all kinds of shapes and forms and qualities, as I said, for example, is measured by the point by serial, and CRT items are good math items. But Eagle uh, believes that if you look at a range of math problems, it might be possible to find regular math problems that are better as math problems than, than CRT is. But, but let's just settle for anything that CRT can do, math can do. Now that's clearly a, a way too broad and wild a, a a conclusion because we didn't check anything. We checked what we checked. We checked a certain selection of reasoning and choice tasks. And your question suggests one manipulation that can perhaps tease the two apart and others can be thought of and we're working there. So let me tell you that, let me tell you that uh, just the other day, Shane, and I thank him for that, pointed me to a paper that was published only last month. I mean, here we are, October 9th, and this paper was published in September 2020, and I hadn't seen it before. And I, I need to ask these people, but I believe that they, not only as they say in the paper, not only did they attempt to replicate and generalize a little bit on our paper, they actually uh, mimicked our style of present our style of presenting the data and and the analyses we did they, they actually followed our lead in everything they they did and they did an interesting twist we said crt problems are math problems with a fast lure is the lure important and we discovered it isn't and here I'm stepping aside a minute and saying again something that I promised to say and didn't come back to. It's the fact that the fast lure didn't matter that does away with a lot of the arguments we have had with lots of people who liked our problems more or less, who didn't like this, who didn't like that, who thought this wasn't. And it turns out, never mind if soup and salad is a good CRT or not. You don't like it as a CRT, let's put it with the math problems because it's a standard math problem that's beyond reproach. And it turns out that any way you divide the set of problems we have, it doesn't matter. They're all the same. And therefore, it also doesn't matter whether we were successful in choosing our MFLs or not. But to come back to this question. So uh, we asked, is the law important? And these people, I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce their names in Croatian, they asked, is the math important? And they found a task that has a fast lure and isn't a math task. And this is what's called the belief bias syllogisms. So these are syllogisms where the conclusion is true, 
but it does not follow from the premises. So the, apparently the first thing that comes to mind is to affirm the validity of the conclusion, but it's true, it does not follow from the premises and you have to think logically in order to realize that. So they replaced the CRT not by math problems with a without a math problems with a fast lure or without. They replaced the math with a task that has a fast lure but no math. And then they did the same analyses I was telling you about and reached the same conclusion. So as I was telling you before, it now turns out, wow, I wonder if everybody who speaks on Zoom as excitedly as I did gets such a dry mouth by the end. Anyway, here we are close to the end. So let's see if I can push through it. It turns out that CRT is not special because of the lures, that, that math is not special because it is math, that a similar thing can be achieved with this belief biases syllogisms, and that there's a mysterious ability or factor which may be G, I don't know, it may be general cognitive ability or not, or disposition to, to go back to Shane's question, or disposition to be careful, disposition to be attentive, disposition to reflect, disposition not to say the first thing that comes to your mind, regardless of whether it came to your mind as a consequence of calculation or of intuition or anything like that. Who knows what it is? But what we, what the four of us have began to do before, before COVID-19, and it kind of stopped us in our tracks, is also to expand on the anything. So CRT has been wonderful in giving people, researchers primarily, a set of three questions that are easily given to respondents and, were, and they were doing wonders. They were predicting not just these reasoning tasks, they were predicting religious beliefs, beliefs about science, beliefs about bullshit, beliefs, paranormal beliefs, the moral beliefs. They were predicting a whole range of tasks that seem intuitively to have nothing to do with cognitive ability or with G, except maybe they do. So what are our next step, which we have begun doing, is first of all to control for the order in which subjects receive the CRT items and the math items in order to do away with the implicit suggestion that CRT items are math items. We shouldn't be begging the question by our procedure. That's one thing that we've addressed. And another is to broaden the, the range of dependent variables and both time and the quality of, of, of the data I have did not allow me to write, to present a paper on that. It's no, coincidence that I presented a paper, a paper on something that exists already rather than on the new stuff that doesn't exist. It's because it's preliminary. But for every lover of the CRT, let me say that it seems like the CRT does, after all, have some advantage in uh, with regard to some tasks. It's not the miracle that some people regard it as. You can do a lot with math, but possibly for reasons that need to be understood, you can do a little bit more than CRT. So I leave you with hope rather than despair. And that's the end of my talk. Any questions from the audience or from the panel? And as you're pondering that, I'm giving you the rest of my slides. So there was a question from, from the audience about the incentives or the payments to the participant in MTurk, just trying to maybe ex explain their responses by essentially trying to finish as quickly as possible and getting paid, and whether there was incentive for accuracy. No, there wasn't. They were only paid for doing the task. But as I told you, uh, in study two of our paper, the respondents were students and they were doing it under 
internally uh, motivated circumstances. In other words, this, they were doing it as part of preparation for taking the GRE. And I think that uh, Cro Croatian authors also used, if I remember correctly, they also used students. So there, it's not all about MTurkers. And I will add to that, that my experience with M M Turkers is I used to be astonished that the word used is workers until I realized that M Turk was not meant to give psychologists a subject. It was meant to give people in the commercial world a data. So it really is work. But here is what I discovered. M Turkers are diligent workers. And I discovered it primarily because when I was doing stumper research, and, 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 it, and stumpers are the kind of riddles where nothing comes to mind, you'd be amazed at what people write when nothing comes to mind. They work very, very hard at bringing something to mind, which, which fortunately enough is seldom the correct answer. That's why it's a stumper. But they don't just say, sorry, I'm stumped and move on to the next thing. They are diligent workers. So. I doubt that it's about incentives, but no, we didn't give any. Maya, can I just, can I just add one uh, suggestion maybe for, for people who are still want to use this task or some variant of it? Like one of the things that my colleague Andrew and I have done in some of the work is to give people a chance to correct their errors. So they enter their first response and then if they're wrong, of course they often are, they'll say 10 cents or whatever. We go, ah, no, that's wrong, try again. And then you, can, then you can see which people basically have the capacity to solve the problem, don't, uh, kind of the careless group, which people solve, you know, which people solve the problem, the savvy group, which people uh, have the capacity but don't, the careless group, and then a pretty large hopeless group, right? And not large at MIT, but large in a lot of places. And you can make uh, distinctions between these three groups. And like we, we find, for example, that for like Kahneman diversity type tasks, there's a big distinction between the savvy and the careless, not such a big distinction between the careless and the hopeless. But for other kinds of tasks, like Raven's matrices or, or measures of G, the big difference is between the careless and the hopeless. And in fact, Andrew, Andrew ran a study where we explicitly invalidated the correct answer. Basically, we said, answer's not 10, right? <laughs> and then that makes the problem actually better as an IQ problem, but it makes it worse for predicting the like, Kahneman tasks. I think we used Linda in that one. So it's not, it's not a gigantic study. We won't draw too much from it. But, but that's usually free if you're doing it electronically, right? Because you can just have people answer again, right? Or you can go just or whatever, right? And so when you're doing it, you might, you might as well. Then you can then you can kind of more finely um, classify people and look at difference between those three groups. And I think that's you know it's easy and useful to answer some of the questions that came up. So, so uh, Shane, not everybody knows, but I know that you have just written with Andrew a monumental paper on the bat and ball problem, studying every possible work and, and angle one can about the bat and ball, including the things that you've just now mentioned. But I wonder if you can do the same, say, with the widgets problem. So if five machines can make five uh, widgets in five minutes, how many uh, machines does it, a uh, hundred machines will make a hundred widgets, how long will it take them? And they say a hundred and you say it's wrong. What do you do then? Yeah. What, I mean, does the, what, what does the respondent do? A respondent who says 100, it's not the same as the bat and ball. No. In the bat and ball, you can check for yourself that it's That's wrong. Right. That's right. And That's here, yeah. I think that if they tell you it's wrong, then maybe, maybe your next guess will be five, not through insight, uh, not through insight, but because the number is out there. But what do you do if you're told it's wrong? I think you are stumped, like in my stumpers. I think many I, I people get, draw a blank. So that, they, I, can, I can tell you for sure for the lily pads problem, you're correct. So if you explicitly invalidate the correct answer, you say it's not 24, people barely do any better. Like that's, that, and I, that's really an insight problem or a stumper. Uh, it's a stumper when provided with the correct answer, as you point out. The, uh, the bat and ball really isn't. They do a lot better. The tools on 10, which is, which is kind of in between. So your intuition's right about that. Um. I, I wonder whether COVID has taught people about exponential growth. Here, I mean, not everybody <laughs> follows the news and, and follows the numbers and reads everything. But here is a, here the world presented us with an opportunity to, to see 
we see what happens when you look at the numbers in the beginning and you shrug them off because they're so small. One, two, four, eight, 16. Give me a break. And next thing you know, it's 20,000 and then it's 40,000 and then it's a million. And when the news tell you, if you're into that kind of news, that the world has just reached the first million. And guess what? Day after tomorrow, it's going to reach the second million. I wonder if people have had a chance to learn what exponential growth is like. Um, so here I, I we hate... are in Israel. <laughs> when we ended our first lockdown, the numbers were, the lockdown ended when our daily uh, new cases was a two digit number and it stayed there for a pretty long time and then it started climbing up and our and our leaders had said once it reaches 100 we're going to take measures and it reached 100 and nobody took measures and then in no time it was 200 and then they said when it reaches a thousand we'll take new measures and it reached a thousand and it was so fast from 1000 to 6000 that they didn't do anything till 6,000. And by the time they did something, it was 9,000. We're a small country, we're 9 million, and we were getting 9,000 new cases a day in no time at all. And I wonder if some of us have learned that that's what exponential growth is like. You look the other way for a second, wham. And now um, it's taking us time to push it down. So with, with that extremely cheerful final note, um, I, I want to thank Maya and all of our panelists for coming today and for all of our audience members for uh, attending. And uh, this has been really great. So thanks everybody and we'll, we'll do this again next week. Thanks, Leif. Thank you all. Thank you.